Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoy my video, please click the like button and share the video. It is the only way the YouTube algorithms really notices me. I will be very grateful to you. The Empty Cradle Rocks by Itself Scary Story Published by Scare Fiction Read for you by Scare Fiction Chapter 1 The Inheritance Car's tires crunched over the gravel as Sarah pulled into the long, winding driveway. The house stood before her like a dark, looming figure from a distant memory. It had been years since she'd set foot here, yet the sight of it brought an immediate heaviness to her chest. Her grandmother's death had reopened wounds she thought had begun to heal. But now, staring at the place she once called home, everything flooded back the grief, the loss, the guilt. She parked, gripping the steering wheel a moment longer than necessary. In the back seat, her daughter's old blanket still lay crumpled, a painful reminder of the life she could never get back. Sarah inhaled sharply and forced herself out of the car. The front door creaked as she opened it, the air inside stale and thick with the scent of old wood and dust. Her footsteps echoed through the large foyer, a space that had once felt grand, but now only felt empty. Welcome home, she muttered bitterly to herself, her voice swallowed by the house's oppressive silence. The house had been in her family for generations, passed down like an unwanted heirloom. She hadn't spoken to her grandmother in years, not since the strained arguments about family obligations and the supposed curse tied to the house. And now here she was, the last in line, inheriting the very thing she had always tried to escape. As she explored, her gaze lingered on old family photographs, people long dead, their faces frozen in time. Each room seemed to have its own personality, full of relics from a past she barely understood. But it wasn't until she reached the nursery that her chest tightened with a deep, familiar ache. There it was, in the center of the room, the cradle. Old and ornate, the wooden cradle looked out of place, even in this ancient house. It had been passed down through generations, a family treasure or curse depending on whom you asked. Sarah shuddered as she approached it, her fingers tracing the intricate carvings along its edges. A cold shiver ran down her spine, and she stepped back, forcing herself to leave the room. That night, as Sarah lay in bed, the house groaned around her, shifting like a creature waking from a long slumber. And then she heard it, a faint creak, rhythmic and steady. The cradle, rocking. She closed her eyes and willed herself to sleep, telling herself it was only the wind. But deep down, she knew better. Something was watching. Something cold. Chapter 2. Unsettling Memories The rhythmic creaking echoed through the darkened house. Sarah lay still in bed, her body tense, the thin sheets tangled around her legs. Her breath came shallow her mind racing to rationalize the sound. It was just the old wood settling, she told herself again, the wind pushing through the drafty windows. But it persisted, the slow, deliberate creak that could only come from the nursery, from the cradle. She sat up abruptly, her heart pounding in her ears. For a long moment, she listened, waiting for the sound to stop. It didn't. Her hand trembled, as she reached for the bedside lamp, the sudden light casting long shadows across the room. Sarah swung her legs over the edge of the bed and stood, her movements cautious, as if afraid the house would notice. It's just your imagination, she repeated silently, but the words felt hollow. In the hallway, the creaking grew louder, pulling her toward the nursery. The door was slightly ajar, a thin sliver of moonlight spilling through the crack. Sarah pushed it open, her pulse quickening as her eyes landed on the cradle. It was moving just slightly, rocking back and forth as if an invisible hand guided it. She froze in the doorway, the chill in the room biting through her thin pajamas. Forcing herself to breathe, Sarah stepped inside and reached for the cradle. The moment her hand touched the wood, the rocking stopped as if whatever force had been pushing it had simply vanished. 
the room fell into a suffocating silence. The next morning, Sarah buried herself in the task of sorting through her grandmother's things, trying to shake the eerie feeling clinging to her. Boxes upon boxes of old photographs, letters, and trinkets filled the dusty attic. As she flipped through a brittle, yellowed photo album, something caught her eye a photograph of her great-great-grandmother standing beside the same cradle, her expression somber. In the background, a faint figure stood at the window, barely visible, as if trying to remain unseen. Sarah's stomach turned uneasily. There was something about her great-great-grandmother that felt too familiar, too close to her own experiences. She flipped the page and found a letter. It detailed the death of her great-great-grandmother's child, a mysterious illness, a baby that was perfectly healthy one moment and gone the next. Her ancestor had written of strange sounds in the night of hearing the cradle rock when no one was there. That night, Sarah dreamed of a crying baby, a pitiful wail that echoed endlessly in her mind. She searched through endless rooms, her hands fumbling to open doors, but every time she reached the cradle, it was empty. The cries only grew louder, more desperate. She woke with a start, the cold air pressing down on her chest. The creaking began again, louder this time. She didn't need to get out of bed to know what it was. The Cradle. Always the Cradle. Chapter 3. The Cradle's Curse. The creaking wouldn't stop. By the third night, it had become a constant, a sound that burrowed into Sarah's mind even in the quiet moments. She no longer bothered to check the nursery, knowing the cradle would be rocking, moving to some unseen force. Each time she heard it, the cold dread inside her grew heavier. In the morning, Sarah sought answers. She drove into town, her fingers drumming anxiously on the steering wheel. The small local library sat tucked between an old diner and a thrift shop, the kind of place she remembered from childhood. She had heard stories growing up whispers about the house, about the cradle, but she had never believed them. Not until now. Inside, the librarian pointed her toward a man named Henry Wallace, the town's unofficial historian. His office was cluttered with books and yellowed papers, his eyes sharp behind wire-rimmed glasses as he regarded her. You inherited that old house, didn't you? He asked, his voice low. I heard about your grandmother passing. Sarah nodded, unsettled by how quickly he seemed to know her story. She hesitated before speaking, feeling foolish even bringing it up, but the words tumbled out before she could stop them. There's something wrong with the house. With the cradle. Henry's expression darkened. He stood and pulled a large, dusty book from the shelf, flipping through the pages until he found what he was looking for. He turned the book toward her, pointing to a photograph of the cradle. The same one that sat in her nursery, its ornate carvings unmistakable. That cradle's been in your family for centuries, Henry said, his voice grave. It's tied to a legend, a curse, if you believe in such things. Sarah stiffened, a curse. Every child who slept in that cradle never made it past infancy. He paused, letting the weight of his words sink in. Your great-great-grandmother, her child died under strange circumstances. And before that, her mother. It goes back generations. No one knows for sure, but there are rumors of a spirit, some say a grieving mother who never found peace. Sarah wanted to dismiss it as superstitious nonsense, but the creaking sounds, the cold presence, the dreams they gnawed at her mind, making it impossible to ignore. That's just a story, she murmured more to herself than to him. But even as she said it, she didn't believe it. Henry's eyes met hers, filled with a grim seriousness. Sometimes, stories are all we have to explain the unexplainable. I suggest you leave the house. Burn that cradle, if you can. 
but Sarah's feet felt rooted to the floor. The cradle was tied to her grief, her loss. It was the only thing connecting her to her daughter, and something deep inside her resisted the idea of leaving. She couldn't just walk away. That night, the creaking returned louder than ever. This time, when Sarah entered the nursery, she saw her a figure standing over the cradle. A ghostly silhouette, swaying as she rocked the cradle, her form pale and translucent in the dim light. Sarah froze, her breath catching in her throat as the woman's head slowly turned toward her. And then, just as quickly as she appeared, the figure was gone, leaving the cradle to rock itself, swaying in the cold, empty room. Chapter 4 Descent into Darkness The figure haunted Sarah's thoughts, lingering in her peripheral vision like a shadow she could never fully catch. Each night, the cradle rocked on its own, faster now, the creaking turning violent, like some unseen force was growing angrier. Sleep was a distant memory, replaced by restless hours spent listening to the house breathe to the invisible presence in the nursery. Days blurred together. Sarah found herself sifting through more of her grandmother's belongings, desperate for answers. In the back of an old cedar chest, she uncovered a worn journal, brittle from age. It belonged to her great-great-grandmother. Sarah sat on the cold floor, flipping through pages filled with erratic handwriting, each entry more unhinged than the last. The cradle is cursed. It took my child, and now it wants me. I can hear him crying, but when I look, there's nothing. Nothing but that damn cradle rocking. The words echoed Sarah's own nightmares. Her great-great-grandmother had spiraled into madness, convinced that the cradle was the source of her torment. As Sarah read on, the woman's descent mirrored her own. She had lost her grip on reality, driven mad by the death of her child, by the cradle that refused to be silent. Sarah's hands shook as she closed the journal. She was no longer sure if the cradle was cursed or if it was all in her head. Was she too going mad? She tried calling her mother, her voice thin and shaky, but their strained conversation ended quickly, her mother warning her once again to leave the house. Sarah ignored the advice, as she had done before. She couldn't leave. The cradle felt like a magnet, pulling her deeper into its orbit. Her daughter's memory was wrapped up in it. To leave the cradle would be to leave behind the last fragile connection she had to her lost child. But the house was getting to her. The isolation, the relentless creaking, the sensation of being watched, it was all too much. She stopped answering calls from her friends, stopped leaving the house altogether. The walls felt like they were closing in, her mind playing tricks on her. She began hearing the baby's cries, soft at first, but growing louder with each passing day. Her heart would race as she ran to the nursery, only to find it empty, the cradle still swaying. One night, the cries became unbearable. Sarah woke to the sound of furious rocking. The cradle was moving violently, slamming back and forth as if something or someone was desperately trying to calm a child that wasn't there. The room vibrated with the sound of a baby screaming, the wails piercing through her skull. Sarah stood frozen in the doorway, her breath coming in short gasps as the cradle shook faster and faster. Stop, she screamed, clutching her head her voice lost in the cacophony. But the cradle didn't stop. It rocked harder, the crying escalating to a fever pitch until suddenly it all ceased. The room fell deathly silent. The cradle lay still, perfectly centered, as if nothing had happened. Chapter 5. Uncovering the Truth Cradle had fallen silent again, but the damage was done. Sarah couldn't shake the sound of the cries that had filled the house the night before. The cradle had rocked itself into her nightmares, each screeching creak echoing in her mind long after the noise had stopped. That morning, bleary-eyed and desperate for answers, Sarah continued her search through her great-great-grandmother's belongings. 
The journal she'd found earlier had only deepened her fear, but she knew there was more. Something had been hidden from her. Something important. She scoured the house, her hands shaking as she tore through drawers and cabinets, pulling out old letters, forgotten trinkets, anything that could explain the strange occurrences. Hours passed, and just when she was ready to give up, she found it a second journal, tucked beneath a floorboard in the nursery, its pages fragile and worn from years of neglect. This journal belonged to her great-great-grandmother. Sarah's heart pounded in her chest as she flipped through the pages, reading the increasingly frantic entries. The woman had been tormented by the same things. Sarah now experienced visions of a child she could never reach, a cradle that rocked itself, and a presence she couldn't see but always felt. It's the cradle, one entry read. I know it now. It holds the spirit of my lost child. I thought I could keep it, that it was the last piece of him I had left. But the cradle doesn't want comfort, it wants pain. Sarah's breath hitched as she read on. Her great-great-grandmother had become convinced that the cradle was cursed, haunted by the spirit of her dead child, who never found peace. The entries became more erratic, filled with warnings. Anyone who uses the cradle will lose their child. The words scrawled angrily across the page. No one escapes the curse, not even by blood. The weight of the journal pressed down on Sarah like a shroud. She felt tethered to her great-great-grandmother's suffering, as if the cradle had passed its curse through the generations, from mother to daughter to her. Guilt over her own daughter's death resurfaced, twisting inside her. Had the curse claimed her child too? Was that why she felt so drawn to the cradle? Why she couldn't leave? That night, Sarah woke to the unmistakable creaking sound. Her eyes shot open, heart hammering. The nursery door had been locked before she went to bed, but the sound wasn't coming from there. It was coming from her bedroom. She gasped, sitting up in bed. The cradle was at the foot of her bed, rocking slowly. Her blood ran cold, and then she saw it a shadowy figure sitting in the rocking chair by the window, cradling something invisible in its arms. The figure moved slowly, humming a soft, eerie lullaby, as if rocking a baby that wasn't there. Sarah's chest tightened, her breath shallow. She couldn't move, couldn't scream. The figure rocked back and forth, its form dark and ethereal. And as it rocked, the cradle kept pace, swaying to the rhythm of an invisible force. She blinked, and the figure vanished, leaving the cradle still rocking in the oppressive silence of the room. Chapter 6. The Entity Emerges Sarah couldn't stay in the house alone any longer. The figure she'd seen in the rocking chair haunted her every waking moment. Cradle's creaking had become relentless, a sound that burrowed into her skull. Her sleepless nights were consumed by dread, and now she knew there was something dark here. Something she couldn't fight on her own. Desperation led her to a local paranormal expert, a man named Alan Winters. His name had come up during her late night searches, whispered in online forums by others who had encountered unexplainable things. Sarah's fingers trembled as she dialed his number, explaining everything, the cradle, the journal, the figure in the rocking chair. Alan didn't hesitate. I'll come by tonight, he said. His voice was calm but heavy, like he'd heard this kind of story before. You're dealing with a powerful entity, and from what you've told me, it's feeding off your grief. That's why it's growing stronger. By the time Alan arrived, the house felt colder than usual. The air was thick with an oppressive heaviness, as though it was weighing down on her shoulders. Alan's face was grave as he stepped inside, his gaze immediately drawn to the cradle in the nursery. He stood in silence for what felt like an eternity, as if sensing something unseen. The spirit here, Alan began, his voice low, isn't just attached to the house. 
It's attached to you. It's feeding on your pain, your guilt over your daughter's death. That's what makes it so powerful. Sarah's heart raced. The idea that her own emotional wounds were fueling the entity made everything worse. Her grief was no longer something internal. It was manifesting in the very walls of the house, growing stronger, more dangerous. What do I do? Sarah asked, her voice barely a whisper. Alan's eyes were hard as he looked at her. You have to confront it. The spirit is tied to the cradle, but it's also tied to your guilt. To break the curse, you'll have to face both. As night fell, the house seemed to come alive with tension. Creaking of the cradle started slowly, as it always did, but this time it was different. The air thickened, charged with a cold, malevolent energy. The sound of a child's cries echoed through the house, louder than ever before. Sarah's pulse quickened as she and Alan stood in the nursery, watching the cradle rock furiously. Then it appeared. The entity emerged from the shadows, a spectral figure of a woman, gaunt and weeping, her hollow eyes locked on the cradle. Her skeletal hands gripped the sides of the cradle, rocking it violently as the child's screams filled the air. Objects around the room began to rattle, then fly across the space, slamming into the walls with terrifying force. Now, Alan shouted over the chaos, you have to confront it. Sarah's body trembled, but she stepped forward, her eyes locked on the ghostly mother. The figure's wails grew louder, deafening, as if daring her to look away. I'm sorry, Sarah whispered, her voice cracking. Tears blurred her vision as the guilt she had buried for so long came pouring out. I am so sorry I couldn't save her. The entity paused, its empty gaze turning towards Sarah. The room fell deathly silent, the cradle coming to a sudden, unnatural stop. For the first time in weeks, Sarah felt a flicker of control. But the fight was far from over. Chapter 7 the final confrontation. The oppressive weight in the house had reached a fever pitch. Sarah stood in the dimly lit nursery, her heart pounding in her chest, hands trembling as she arranged candles and scattered salt in a protective circle around the cradle. Alan's instructions had been clear. The ritual required focus, strength, and an acknowledgement of the spirit's pain. But as Sarah prepared for the final confrontation, doubt gnawed at her. The ghostly mother's cries echoed in her mind, mingling with her own memories of her daughter's death. Each flicker of candlelight cast ominous shadows on the walls, amplifying the room's already menacing atmosphere. Sarah clenched her jaw, trying to steady her nerves. This was it, the moment she had to face the entity once and for all. The ritual began. Sarah chanted the ancient incantations Alan had taught her, her voice barely above a whisper. The candles flickered, casting erratic shadows that danced across the walls. The air grew colder, and the cradle started to rock gently, its movement synchronized with Sarah's chants. But something was wrong. The temperature dropped rapidly. Cradle's gentle rocking turned into a violent, uncontrolled thrashing. The candles blew out one by one, plunging the room into darkness. Sarah's heart raced. She felt a sudden, icy grip around her throat, and the oppressive presence she had felt all along intensified, swirling around her like a tornado of despair. From the darkness emerged the entity in its true, grotesque form. The spectral mother was now a horrifying distortion of grief and rage, her body twisted and misshapen, her face a grotesque mask of anguish and anger. The room shook violently, as if the house itself was fighting against the spirit. Cradle moved uncontrollably, crashing against the walls, and the air was filled with a cacophony of wailing and screeching. Sarah stumbled, barely able to keep her footing. The monstrous figure loomed over her, its eyes hollow, 
its mouth stretched into a ghastly scream. It wasn't just a spirit. It was an embodiment of every sorrow and torment it had absorbed over the generations. Face your grief. The spirit's voice echoed through the room, distorting and overlapping. Sarah fought to remain standing, tears streaming down her face. She had to confront her own pain, the loss she had never truly faced. The pain of her daughter's death was a weight she had carried alone, a burden that had fueled the spirit's strength. With a cry of defiance, Sarah reached out, her hand trembling but determined. I am here, she shouted, her voice breaking. I am not running anymore. I am here to face this, to end it. The spirit's roar of fury filled the room, the house shaking violently. Sarah's surroundings blurred, and she felt as if she was being torn apart by the force of the spirit's rage. But through the chaos, she continued to speak her truth, her sorrow and strength melding into a powerful force. The entity writhed, its form distorting further, and with one final anguished scream, it seemed to collapse inward, its dark essence dissipating into nothingness. Cradle's wild rocking slowed, coming to a gentle stop as silence fell over the room. Sarah fell to her knees, gasping for breath, her body drained but her spirit lighter. The house was still, the oppressive weight lifted. She had faced the darkness, and for now, she had won. But the battle had taken its toll, and the journey toward healing had only just begun. Chapter 8 The Haunting Ends or does it? The first light of dawn seeped through the cracks in the old house's wooden shutters, casting pale stripes across the nursery floor. The violent tremors had ceased, and the room was now eerily calm. Sarah sat slumped against the wall, her body trembling from exhaustion and relief. The cradle, once a vessel of torment, was finally still. Alan stood beside her, his face etched with concern. The ghostly entity was gone, its rage dissipated into nothingness, leaving behind a quiet that felt almost unnatural. Sarah's mind swirled with the aftermath of the confrontation, the cacophony of screams, the entity's grotesque form, and her own desperate cry of defiance. She had faced her darkest fears and confronted the source of her deepest sorrow, but the victory felt bittersweet. Alan helped Sarah to her feet, his eyes scanning the room with a cautious respect. You did well, he said softly. You faced the spirit and your own grief. But remember, these things can leave traces. The house may be quiet now, but it's wise to stay vigilant. Sarah nodded, her gaze lingering on the cradle. Its once ominous presence now seemed almost benign in the light of day. She slowly gathered her belongings, the task now feeling almost mundane compared to the terror she had faced. The house, though silent, seemed to hold its breath, as if waiting for something. As she left the nursery and walked down the creaking hallway, a strange sense of unease settled over her. The house had been a cage of horror, but it was also a repository of her pain and memories. She turned one last time to look at the cradle, her heart heavy. The sun's rays illuminated the nursery, casting long shadows that danced eerily across the walls. With a final, deep breath, Sarah stepped out of the house, the door closing behind her with a finality that echoed in the empty street. The fresh air felt liberating, but the weight of her experience pressed heavily on her shoulders. She had faced the darkness, and emerged scarred, but stronger. Her confrontation with the spirit had brought a semblance of closure, yet the shadow of doubt lingered. As Sarah walked away, the sound of the cradle's faint creak reached her ears. It was a subtle, almost imperceptible sound, but it sent a shiver down her spine. She paused, glancing back at the house. Cradle stood motionless, bathed in the morning light but the memory of its haunting creak remained. Had she truly broken the curse? 
Or had the spirit simply retreated to wait for its next opportunity? Question lingered in the back of her mind, unanswered and unsettling. Sarah continued down the path, her steps echoing with uncertainty. The cradle's creak faded into the distance, but in the quiet aftermath, Sarah knew one thing for sure. The darkness had not completely vanished. It lingered like a whisper in the wind, hinting that the curse might not be entirely broken. The house was silent, but its shadow remained, waiting.